We'll get into the message today. We've been talking about the Christmas holidays and the message of Christmas from the New Testament. Not always the same message as the world is declaring, but it's the message that we need to hear when it comes down to the message of Jesus Christ. In fact, as we talk about Christmas and the Christmas season, last week we talked about God with us and Emmanuel, but you know, this is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ we'll be celebrating in a couple of days, and we have to remember that, that this is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel, that God sent his only begotten son. And the whole message of Christmas just gets back to, to Jesus. He is the reason for the season. Wouldn't be a season without him, by the way, to start with. Amen? He's the creator of all things. But as we get into the gift of the wise men, let me just give you a, a little background to the story this morning as we talk about the wise men. I've read so many different things over the years about who they were and then seen all the Hollywood productions about the wise men and we three kings of Orient are. Let me give you a little biblical update, all right, because sometimes that's a little different. Sometimes it's way different from what the world tells us. These men were from what we would call, you know, the, the uh, Iran, Iraq region, Babylon, Persia, Medo-Persian Empire at that time. These men were not most likely Gentiles who would have no interest in the king. They were part of the Majestanes, a very high group in the parliament of, uh, of, the, of the government of the Babylonians and the Medo-Persian Empire that was, that was in place in the time of Jesus Christ. These were called, translated wise men. They were wise, that may not be the most accurate translations, but they were, they were literally called kingmakers in their day. They were the guys who, were, uh, who would recognize the, the, and, and anoint the kings to come in, in their own particular land and government. When it comes to these particular men, uh, again, kind of get away from the idea of what we might have even in our own nativity scene because they probably weren't even there when the shepherds were. They came at a time later. So and we see all the Christmas cards and stuff, but let's, let's get our thinking biblical. These men, as we said, were from that part of the world. These men were high-ranking government officials. These men were probably more than three who traveled. Remember, uh, these are high-ranking government officials. They probably did not come by themselves. They were most likely accompanied by a very large cavalry. Some are saying at least 200 would travel, 200 soldiers would travel with a party like this of, these, of, of royalty from, from this particular group. So you had a, a large group. I mean, it makes sense because even in the New Testament, it says when they arrived in Jerusalem to ask where the, where the baby was, it says that Herod was very afraid. He had reason to be afraid. Much of the Roman troops were fighting on another front. There wasn't a lot of protection in Jerusalem at the time. And here comes a large garrison showing up at the front door of the palace, 200 plus at least. And so he, he's a little bit concerned. He was pretty much a paranoid schizophrenic to start with. He was pretty much a crazy guy. We see what he did with the, the, the slaughter of the innocent children in Bethlehem later. So we understand that mentality of that particular kind of man. So he's afraid when they show up. They find their way to Bethlehem as they follow the sign. Now, the sign was something that they had been, had been revealed to them. It leads them up to, the, up to Israel and to the nation of Palestine at the time, was, which was no nation. It was a Roman empire at that particular time in history. But this particular sign, as we look at Scripture, was not like, you know, a star in the sky. That's a, that's a, a bad translation of, of the word in Scripture. It wasn't the, the sign is the word sign. It wasn't a star. It says, they, we have seen his sign. It was translated in the King James, his star, in, in, in the sky. Now, again, let me get back to these, these men and who they were to help us understand what they're looking for. These men were most likely not kings from that part of the world. These men were most likely descendants of sons of Abraham. These men were probably descendants of guys like Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. Remember, in the Old Testament, Israel to captivity by the Babylonians, all right? And then later under the siege of the Medo-Persian Empire, it falls there. And, and so we see that these men were children. Remember when the Babylonians captured Israel and carried away a great deal of people captivity, they took the wisest, the best of the population to take them back to Babylon with them. These men were so uh, uh, well-received, they um, leaders in the nation. Daniel becomes the number two leader. Remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were leaders. They, were, they had found places of favor in the government uh, of Babylon. They were well received and recognized, even though uh, we see their, their conflicts with those who hated God and hated the Jewish people there. They rose, to, where, no matter what happened, they continued to rise to authority. Even after the fire, they were recognized even on a greater level. So I believe that these Majestanes, these wise men, were descendants of, of, of these guys and remained in, in, in great positions of authority and power in the house of Majestanes. So we most likely don't have 
Gentiles who had knew nothing of Scripture and knew nothing of prophecy, knew nothing of a coming king. We have a group of men who probably well understood the prophecies of the Old Testament and had studied them most of their lives and were familiar that Messiah would be born. And understanding Daniel, the book of Daniel, there were some specific times, you know, that are, that are late, related in scriptures to when Messiah would come, when he'd be born, when he'd be cut off, his crucifixion. So <clears throat> they're not ignorant men, and they're coming in search. So they're following a sign that's been given to him. The sign that's been given to him had to be something they were familiar with. It would be a, a heavenly and a holy sign. I believe that was the same sign that accompanied the children of Israel when they were traveling in the wilderness. Remember, it said a cloud by day and a fire by night. These men are led hundreds and hundreds of miles by a fire, a, sky, a fiery sign in the sky. It could be translated a star, but this wasn't like a comet or Kepler's theory, you know, that this was a comet that came by so close particular time. In fact, if it had been a comet, it had probably burned up little baby Jesus in the manger, all right? Because it said it stood over where the young child was. You get a comet that close to earth standing over in something that's still, you got a disaster on your hands, all right? So in, in the proper perspective, you're dealing with men who are probably descendants of Abraham. You're dealing with men who are looking for Messiah. You're dealing with people who are familiar with the scriptures and understand what a sign would be when they saw the sign and followed that sign. Remember, it did lead the children of Israel. And so it was a sign that they could follow. So as you study the scripture and you start getting a little clearer picture of who these guys were and, and what was going on, and it kind of begins to make a whole lot more sense, you know, when we realize what the, what the scriptures are relating to us. Get there, it says that these men came and they worshiped the Lord Jesus. In fact, we're going to read just a couple of verses, our passage. Why don't you stand with me as we read from Matthew chapter 2. We'll have it on the screen. You can look it up in your passage if, if you so desire. But in Matthew chapter 2, there's 10 verses we're going to focus on this morning as we talk about these wise men and the gifts that they brought. And understand in talking about that, we're going to also, as we always do, show you what, you know, you see these eternal stories and principles in Scripture, but how do they apply? And I think there's a lot that we can apply to our in this situation today. Matthew, it says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground, and they worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Those might seem like some strange gifts, but they're the gifts the wise men brought. So let's look at that today. Let's say amen to the reading of the word. You may be seated. You may be seated. The wise men, as they're gathering there together, says they worshipped him, and they opened their treasures up, and the treasures that they presented... Now, distinctly, it tells us these specific three things, the gold, the frankincense, and the mirth. They brought gold. Why? Because they're looking for a king. As I said, these men are called the king makers in, the, in their own nation. They're looking for one who is a king. If you're going to bring gifts to a king, you want to bring gifts that are suitable for a king. And what is more suitable than gold? It represents Jesus Christ. It represents his kingship. You know, I believe these guys are familiar with the Old Testament passage, not only of Daniel, but also in Isaiah where it says, you know, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from this time forth, even forever. So that there's this passage that these men, I believe, are familiar with the Old Testament. They're responding to the sign that's been given to them. And they're responding, they're looking for a king. And they come and they find the king. And they worship him and they open these gifts. Well, obviously, gold is the most... Uh, to me, the most obvious gift to, to give a king. Now, if you don't understand it, you might just back off a little bit. This little baby, born in this little nasty place, all right, most likely a cave-type dwelling. We call it a, a stable. But if you've been to Bethlehem and if you've visited the shepherds in the fields, they don't have barns and stables out there. They have a lot of grottos, little cave openings in the limestone where they shelter their sheep at night and where they, they lay in the front and take the sheep in, and then they take them out to pasture in the morning. This is most likely where Jesus was born, in one of these little grottos. And as they're out there, they come, they see this babe, but they recognize him and his authority. And please, when you read the Scripture, you have to understand, it's not just little baby Jesus. It's wonderful to talk about little baby Jesus and sing Away in a Manger and Silent Night. Those are great songs. But understand, little baby Jesus is king baby Jesus, all right? He is a king, and he's worthy of a kingdom, and he's described as a king. In fact, he is known as the Prince of Peace in the passage we just read. A prince, 
This is a prince who has a kingdom, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It reveals in this kingdom that it has a king, and that king is ultimately the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the kingdom, the king over the kingdom of heaven. He's the king over the kingdom of earth. He is the king of kings. And so they're coming with a recognition. Here's the king. This king has all authority and all divinity and all power. The Bible says all authority has been given unto Jesus Christ. So he is king. So as we think about baby Jesus, let's remember baby Jesus is also King Jesus. As a king and over a government, he has the power to grant life and to take it away. You see this passage in Matthew where he talks about the authority of kings and nations and government. In fact, he talks about even taking his own life and laying his life down as a gift for many. So he's a king with authority. He's a king who has the power of a king. And he is, he is a king with dominion and rule. The most amazing part about this king, though, which authorizes his kingship, he's also God in the flesh. We call it the incarnation, the indwelling. God takes on humanity. He's born as a little baby in a manger. He becomes a man at this point. The Bible says that he came and he was born into this dark world as the light of this world. And he is the light of hope, but he's also the king of authority. In fact, in Revelation, when you're reading the last uh, of the passages that talk about the end times in the prophetic book of Revelation. It shows Jesus Christ coming back, and it says uh, on his robe and on his thigh, there's a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So understand, a lot of people don't get this. I think especially in the Jewish culture, they miss this mark. The Jews are looking for a deliverer. They're looking for a Savior. They're looking for a Messiah. They don't understand that Jesus Christ's coming was basically twofold. One had to deal... <coughs> with judgment, that he would take upon our sins and would face judgment for us. The second coming has to do with his reigning, all right, as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so he sets his, himself up in Jerusalem in the, in the throne of David as the king of all kings. And the Bible tells us that all the nations, all the prime ministers, all the other kings, all the presidents, they will all go up to Jerusalem and they'll recognize his kingship and they'll recognize his authority. So when they come, they're bringing gold. Why? Because he's a king. If you read some of the meetings between kings in the Old Testament or in kings and queens like Sheba and Solomon and read the list of gifts that are exchanged or given, you'll see gold is one of the first mentioned. A recognition of authority and a recognition of power. So the, these wise men, what do they bring? They bring gold because Jesus is the king of kings and gold is worthy as a gift for a king. But not only do they bring gold, the Bible says they brought a couple of other things that might seem just a bit strange until we begin to peel back a few layers of the Scripture. One says that, 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 that one of the gifts is that he bring, the kings bring frankincense. Now, the English word is derived from an old French term, two words, frank and sense, which means, it really means pure incense, all right? It's pure incense. And what this particular incense is, it's frankincense. Frankincense was, a, as we said on the screen, there's this odorous resin imported from Arabia. Easton's Bible Dictionary says it was one of the ingredients of the perfume in the sanctuary. In other words, when they would worship the Lord and have sacrifices, that it was used. It was sprinkled upon the offerings that were made, the sacrifices that were being presented in the Old Testament to God. They sprinkled the meat offerings with this. So that when the offering would go upon the altar and the fire there, it would emit just this beautiful, wonderful smelling fragrance. Now, I don't know about you. I just like driving by Spring Creek Barbecue. That's a good fragrance to me. But then you add, you know, the, the, the elements of the incense that's being presented. It's a sign of, uh, of recognition of his deity. It's a, it's a sign of worship. It's a sign of, of prayer. In fact, frankincense is, is tapped and comes as the sap out of a very scraggy you know, but real hardy tree called a bazuela tree. And what they do with this particular tree to, to harvest the, this, this resin out of it, they slash the bark. In fact, the process is called stripping. They strip the bark and they allow the resins that are exuding to just bleed out. And as they're bleeding out, they don't harvest them right away like you would with a, a syrup or something. They allow that resin to harden on, 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 the, on the tree even. These hardened little resins that are flowing out uh, this is really good if you think about all the passages concerning this, this. They're called tears, all right? Tears. 
And, and then, they're, then they're harvested at that point. You think about all the passages about our tears and the treasure of our tears before the Lord and how the Lord wept for us and how he wept for Lazarus at the grave. But when you look at everything that frankincense represents, these men are bringing something that is really an act of worship because they're presenting it to Jesus who is truly going to be is this God man and, and this man God. He's going to be the offering for your sin. He's going to be the sacrifice for our sins. And so it's in preparation that they're giving this. All right? The incense itself, as it's been presented by, by the Magi, by, by these wise men, it speaks of Jesus' divinity. Because when the priest would go in and they'd, they'd begin to prepare the Holy of Holies and the holy place for worship, the incense would be continually burning there and this sweet aroma and smell would come up. So as they're coming in to see the babe and see Mary and to see Joseph there and see Jesus most likely sitting in the lap of his own mother, he's worshipped as the Lord of Lords. He's worshipped as king with his presentation of, of this aromic, this, this odorous, sweet-smelling perfume of frankincense, this incense. It speaks to us not only about his divinity, it speaks to us about his sacrifice, that he also becomes the lamb that is slain. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5 that Christ loved us. He died for our sins, that he presented himself and gave himself for us, what? As an offering. He gave himself as a sacrifice to God, a sweet-smelling aroma. So the wisdom of these men, as, they, as I believe they understood the Scriptures that we'll look at in just a moment in Isaiah and other passages that Jesus first would come and present himself as an offering, it's an offering that is, is prepared. In Isaiah, there's mention of this, and I believe these men would be very familiar with these passages of Isaiah. It's a prophecy about Jesus as he was wounded for our transgressions. He's bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to slaughter, as a sheep before its shears silent, so he opened not his mouth. Amen. What a tremendous passage. Hundreds of years before Christ is born. So these men, in, in, in their discernment and in their wisdom, are presenting this offering. Paul went on to say of this kind of, the, of this idea of the Jesus' sacrifice in verse 3 and 4 of chapter 15 to his first letter to the Corinthians. It says, Christ died for our sin according to the Scriptures. In other words, it was prophesied. And he did what was prophesied him. He was buried. He rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. What's the apostle saying to the Corinthian church? He says, all this stuff about Jesus, this isn't just something that just come lately. This is something that's been in Scriptures that was foretold us. And these wise men, I believe in an understanding and a comprehension of this, realizing Jesus will become the sacrificial lamb who will be slain, who will be sacrificed, who will be stripped, who will be beaten, who will bleed and will suffer is Jesus Christ, and the frankincense represents not only worship, adoration, prayer, but it represents, I believe, Jesus' sacrifice of his own wife. The third gift, frankincense and what? Myrrh. Myrrh is another item that's harvested from trees, all right? This is a, a, a tree in, in, in the Middle East that represents a, uh, like an acacia tree for us. It's found in Africa. It's found in, in Arabia. It's, it's, it's a gum. It's the viscid white liquid that flows out of this tree. It's a little small, brushy type tree plant, and it's cultivated, especially in ancient times in the Arabian Peninsula. It was cultivated for this particular resin. They would do something similar, but they would make a small cut in this little bushy tree, all right? And the resin begins, would begin to leak out. Instead of letting it dry and harden, they would collect it immediately and let it harden and dry for about a process of about three months. And it would form these little fragrant globulates, you know, the little globules that would be formed. That would then be taken raw or, or, or crushed and mixed with oil. The oil would become a very fragrant perfume. It was used medically even in the time of Jesus Christ. It was used medically to reduce swelling or to, to stop pain. In fact, it's, it's a, one of the main ingredients in many uh, Chinese medicines for a variety of its, uh, uh, a variety of ailments it's prescribed. But it, it's a very powerful little, little fragrant resin, all right? It sometimes was used in ancient times 
to be offered to prisoners. Remember, Jesus was offered gall on the tree. Gall was a mixture of that wine and, and this particular myrrh. It was offered to Jesus. Although he did not partake of it, it was offered to him. So if you really want a good, a good picture of what myrrh represents, it would represent clearly the, cruci the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and everything that he had to do endure on the cross for you and I, all that was given for us. It was also used in, in ancient times as an embalming fluid, all right? If you look at Smith's Bible Dictionary, it would, it, would, it would tell you that it was used in this particular place. In Mark chapter 15, remember Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate and he asks for the body of Jesus. And he takes it and he wraps it in white linen and he lays it in a, in a, in a tomb. And he seals the tomb with a rock. It wasn't too many days after that that Mary came and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus and, and Salome, they brought, they brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus Christ for his burial. Myrrh was most likely one of those spices that was used. Would I doubt for a moment that myrrh from the night that was presented to Jesus was used? Not at all. So it would be held for, for this moment, this prophetic moment, as these wise men are looking not only at the present, but what is going to happen according to scriptures, that he would be led like a lamb to slaughter, that he would be sacrificed, that he would die for our sins, that he would suffer a cruel death, and that ultimately he'd go to the tomb and be prepared for burial. And so myrrh is given. But myrrh is, is interesting because as you look at this particular incense in this particular passage, you know, the myrrh tells of the suffering of Jesus himself. It tells of that death. It tells of that burial. And it's important to realize that Jesus not only died for our sins, that he was buried. He, he died and was buried for us. But we also, he didn't stay in that tomb very long, all right, as the other great prophets who had come before him. Jesus came out of the grave. He was a prophet, and he is our priest, but he also is our king, and he is our resurrected living king. He is the very son of God. He didn't stay dead. Jesus Christ faced my death. And remember this, and I've said it before, but I don't think I can say it enough. If I had to die for my sins, to pay the price for my sins, it wouldn't pay for the price. It would, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. There's no way I, I'm going to sufficiently pay the price for my sins because once I'm dead, I'm dead, all right? It doesn't cover it. But when Jesus Christ came, his, his death paid the price for all men's sin. Now, why was mine no good? Let's go back to the Old Testament. Every sacrifice had to be presented as pure and innocent and without spot, right? No blemish. The problem with my offering, I'm filled with blemishes. I have sin in my life. I have done things which I'm ashamed of. Some of you, you wouldn't dare get up and tell anybody else what it was, but you know what I'm talking about, all right? You've done things. You, you, you have willingly disobeyed God in your life. You willingly chose to rebel against God. You willingly chose to do what you knew, even in the moment, was not the right thing, and you sinned. But Jesus, the Bible says, he who knew no sin. He's an acceptable offering for God. And so he goes into death, and he faces death, and death does not conquer him. He faces the grave. The grave does not conquer him. He is risen from the dead, victorious over death, victorious over the grave, victorious over the hell, as the living Lord of lords and King of kings. He is our risen Savior. <laughs> He's an acceptable sacrifice by God. And he became victorious over the sin and the death. And it was witnessed and it was testified to when God raised him from the dead. You can think about it. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, we would never know that the offering was acceptable. But it was acceptable because he presented himself. So the myrrh, I believe, represents death. Myrrh represents the burial we know he overcame death in the grave through his resurrection. But understand, I believe it perfectly represents death and burial, the price being paid. Now, the good question would be, what gifts can we bring? If you go back to that passage in Matthew chapter 2, verses uh, 10 and 11, verse 11 says, the Magi came and they stood in the presence of Jesus, all right? And what do they do there? It says the first thing they do is that they, they fell down and worshiped him. They fell down, and they worshiped baby Jesus. That was the first. And the second thing, I don't know how long they're there. I don't know how long they worship. We don't know. And again, we don't know if there's three, ten, two, all right? 
<coughs> it's plural. That's all we know. We don't know how many men are outside the area attending them. But it says they fell down. And the second thing it says in verse 11, it says they opened up their treasures. Now, the NLT, the New Living Translation says, they opened up their treasure chest. And literally, it means there were chests, plural, of treasure. Now, it mentions gold and frankincense and myrrh. These were costly spices as well there. But, you know, it sounds from the way it's described in Scripture, there's, the, there's kind of a big hoard here, you know. And remember, these guys, I don't believe these are guys looking for how little they can bring. You know, this is not like the Christmas offering Believers Fellowship trying to figure out how little we can get away with giving. <laughs> They're trying to figure out how much they can bring. Now, they, they were equestrians. They had the finest cavalry in the world at that, no, that particular time of the world. So they traveled on horses, contrary to the postcard at Hallmark. If they had camels, they were used for carrying cargo, supplies, tents, food, you know, all those kind of things, and treasures. Here's this moment where they're bringing the treasures, where they're having their men bring them in and popping open these treasures. Now, over here in the little mini strangers, and you got these little sweet boxes and stuff. But <clears throat> I believe, come on, they're worshiping the King of Kings. Yes. This is the long awaited for Messiah. Yes. This is, you know, this is the, the long awaited for our King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so they're opening up their treasure chest and they're presenting the gold and the frankincense, and the myrrh, and they're presenting them with such freedom and such liberality, and, and I believe with such joy. It was a treasure that was fit for a king. What are we going to bring? My stock of gold is a little down right now. Got a little right back here, I think. <laughs> we can also bring gold, not of this particular fashion, but we understand what's going on with the idea of the worship and the majesty and the recognition of his king of kings, we bring Jesus gold when we recognize his authority over our life. Amen. In fact, the scriptures tells us that our faith in 1 Peter 1, 7 is much more precious than gold. If you really want to bring an honorable gift for the king of kings and lord of lords, you commit your heart and your life to him. In fact, in, in, uh, it goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, as Paul's writing to the church there, he says, listen, that your very deeds that you're doing for the Lord, the way you're living your life, he says, that, that, is, that is like precious gold. So if I'm seriously interested in bringing the Lord the gold that will honor him the most, it's going to be a life, number one, of surrendering my heart and my life to him, my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, that's a word that's tossed around a lot today. You hear a lot of people say, well, there's all faith and all faith. No, the Bible says there's only one faith, all right? There's many religions, and that's what the world means when they're talking about faiths. It's religions. There's a lot of people who have religions, all right? There's all kinds of religions in the world. But faith is completely different. Faith in the one faith is my faith in God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to change my life, to accept me for, a, who, for, for what Jesus has done for me, that Jesus Christ paid the price for me and for my sins. And so my faith is in God, not to save myself, not for me to have enough works and efforts. You know, and there's all kinds, as you look at the different religions of the world, all kinds of things you can do to find salvation through the eyes of man's religion. Do this, do that, don't cut your hair, do cut your hair, you know, uh, all the different kinds of things, you know, uh, only you know, shave your head except for a ponytail, and on and on the list goes. Don't, you know, grow a beard, you know, if you grow a beard, don't shave it. There's a lot of stuff that men require. There's only one thing God requires. The sacrifice for your sins was an acceptable gift by God the Father. So the only thing he's waiting for you now is to receive the gift in faith and to put your life in the hands of Jesus Christ, all right, to give your heart to Christ. Have you done that? You say, well, I'm a Baptist. And that's not what I'm asking. You've given your heart to a denomination, perhaps. You need to give your heart to Jesus. Well, I'm a good person. Uh, well, you're putting your trust in your good works. Good luck with that. It's not going to work. The Bible says it's not of works lest we should boast. And what's happening, when you say that, I'm a good person, what you're saying is you're just boasting of what you've done. Unfortunately, it won't work. The Bible says we've, we've, been, we've been tarnished, we've been stained, we've been blemished by sin, so my good works aren't an acceptable offering. But Jesus Christ, without blemish, without stain, he's an acceptable offering. Hallelujah. And he presented himself on your behalf. You want to present gold to the Lord, then you give your heart. But not only that, for the believer, once we've given heart to Christ, faith is not a one-time thing that I just choose Jesus. The Bible talks about the just shall live by faith. I'm living for Jesus. Are you living for Christ? 
Uh, you know, the Bible says whatever you do, whether you eat or whether you drink, whatever, do it all for the glory of God. Everything in our life should really be just pointing to Jesus as our Lord. I'm doing this for the glory of God. I'm, I'm, I want to be a righteous husband for the glory of God. I want to be a righteous uh, leader of, of people for the glory of God. I want, to be a, I want to be a righteous man for the glory of God. I want to be a good dad for the glory of God. Ultimately, it all is for him. And that's, that's what it means to really be presenting, I believe, real gold, that which is valuable, because what God desires more than anything else is your heart of love to him, because his heart of love has already been manifest towards you. He's given it all. So we present gold when we present our, our, our lives and our hearts to Jesus Christ in faith. We bring frankincense when we recognize that Jesus sacrificed for our sins, all right, and we in turn offer our lives as a living sacrifice. The Bible says present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God. Catch the rest of this verse. For this is your reasonable service of worship. In other words, God says, <clears throat> here's the way you live your life for me. Just present yourself as a living sacrifice. I gave myself as a sacrifice that would be killed, and I rose from the dead. Now I want you to live for me. That's frankincense. That becomes a sweet-smelling savor. The apostles talk about how our lives and our prayers and our worship is a sweet-smelling savor to God. We come to the Lord in, with an attitude of, of surrender. We come to the Lord, and our surrender, by the way, is worship. That's the way we glorify God. That's the way we honor the Lord. So if I'm going to present frankincense to the Lord and, 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 and present it in, in a real way, then I'm going to present my body to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I start living with an attitude of worship. John 4 says, if we're going to worship God, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? One, I, I can't worship God if I don't have God's spirit. We worship God's spirit. So Jesus says, you must be born of the Spirit. You're reborn. How's that happen? You present your heart to Christ. He comes into your life. But it also says we worship God in spirit and in truth. Truth means what? Well, there's two elements here. One is this idea of truth being just transparent. I can't play games with God. I can't hide things in my life. I, I can't leave doors unopened for Him. I, everything's open. Everything's committed. Everything's on the altar. So the Lord that I just need to surrender. I, I just I have to be clear and open and transparent before the Lord. But there's also the truth. The way that we worship God is through what he's given us, his word, his truth. The truth shall set us free. I embrace the truth. I don't run from the truth. I don't try to pick and choose at the Bible like it's things. Well, I don't like that part and I like this part. Isn't that the culture we're living in? We're living in such a, a subjective culture today. People just kind of take from God and Jesus and the Bible what they want and they leave the rest. Well, this is the way I see it. This is the way I believe it. This is the way I feel about it. This is what I think. Here's my truth. That's a dangerous way to live your life. Because your truth can pretty much be a lie if it's not God's truth. That's why we have this revelation called the Holy Scriptures. It shows us what truth is. And so I, you know, I, if I'm going to worship God in spirit and in truth, and it says, I'm going to embrace the Word of God, and this is going to be my guide all right, it's the God book, it's my God book. I'm not going to try to pick and shoot, well, I don't like that, or that's just too hard, or that's too difficult, or I don't think I can do that. It's a submission of my heart, of my life, to Jesus Christ and saying, I'm going to worship you for my life, all right? Yes. Then there's the presentation of myrrh. When we talked about this myrrh and how it's, it's, it was presented in crucifixion and in burial, we have to understand that as Christian. Not only have I come to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I'm coming to the cross to live my daily life, to present this element of myrrh in my faith. It really means that I'm taking my place, you know, with Jesus Christ. You say, what's your place? Your place is in not only the resurrection of Jesus, but the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. That's myrrh. That's myrrh. That you've committed your life to Christ, and yes, you realize that now, not only am I this living sacrifice, but it means I go to the cross daily. Magnolia campus today, we had a baptism. And I was making reference to the baptism in connection with this particular presence of myrrh. In baptism, we see a great picture of the death and the burial of, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ right? The water represents the, the, 
the death, all right? We're buried in that water. Now, baptism doesn't save us. There's two sacraments that the Lord has commanded we should observe in the church, and one is this ordinance of, of the Lord's Supper because it preaches the message of the cross of Jesus, right? The blood and the body of Christ given for us. And the other that's given to us as a command to do, these are only two in the scriptures it tells us as the ordinances that we do, is baptism. That once we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we should follow the Lord by giving a public testimony of that through baptism. Well, you know, let's everything you might know about the Bible and think about that from a purely human standpoint. Why in the world does God want me to get dunked in water? I had a bath. It was Saturday yesterday. Yeah. But there's this great picture, just as there is in the communion, there's this tremendous picture of a life that goes down into death and is buried in that water and this washed as it comes forth in new life. All right? Now, that happened the moment you gave your life to Jesus Christ. You bear a testimony of it when you get experienced water baptism. You say, well, I've given my life to Jesus, but I haven't been water baptized. Well, you're backslidden already, all right? Because baptism is a commandment from the Scripture that we're to do. It doesn't save us, but we should be bearing this public testimony that our lives have been changed by Christ Jesus. And so I would say today, if you've never been baptized, all right, since you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, the next step for you, you know, is to follow the Lord in baptism. You need to come, well, Brother Joe, I've been a Christian for 30 years now. Hey, well, it's about time then. All right, let's get baptized. You know, after the service, talk to the Henleys, talk to me or Brother Gary. Somebody said, I don't know more about baptism. We'll get with you on it. But it's a tremendous picture of the way we live our lives now. That's the symbol. The reality is I am claiming daily that I've experienced that. Romans 6, if you're struggling with some particular besetting sin in your life, you haven't gotten free yet, all right, even though you know all the Bible verses, I would encourage you to take Romans chapter 6 and memorize it. It was my liberation chapter for me personally in my life. With all the garbage, when I gave my life to Jesus, you know, you could have called me the junk man because I had a lot of junk in my life, all right? With all the garbage, it was, it was that redeeming, glorious, great passage of Scripture that just began to memorize and meditate on daily, ultimately end up memorizing the whole chapter because it was so liberating. But he starts, I says, so she says to the church, are we supposed to continue in sin? In other words, we're saved by grace because we're sinners. We couldn't save ourselves. But do we continue in sin? So the grace may abound. Anybody know the next two words? Certainly not. King James, God forbid. <laughs> God forbid. No way. Don't cont- well, if you give your life to Jesus, quit living that old way. You have a new life. Why? Because he says you were buried with Christ in baptism. Just as like Christ, you know, was, was, was buried, so were we. So when I came to Jesus Christ, often we talk about, well, he came into my heart. Catch this part. I came into him. The Bible says, I became one with him. And now, this is what baptism represents. When, when Jesus Christ comes into you, at the same moment, you're coming into his body, into him. All right? So you become one in Christ Jesus. We need to live our life. And for us to present myrrh, I believe, is to take a position in my life that, hey, I've experienced death, and now I'm alive. But today, I'm going to die today. Paul said, I die daily. And for my presentation of murder to take place, I believe it means I come back to the truth of that and say, I'm surrendering my life to Jesus. I'm crucified to Christ. I'm alive, but now it's Jesus that lives in me. I think this, you know, I, I, I don't know what's happened in the church today. You got people, you got to beg them to come to church anymore. You got to beg them to be on time for church. We've lost, the, we've lost Jesus somewhere in the midst. We've lost the concept of worship. I mean, if I can be on time for work every day and then still not be in time for church, what are you talking about this this morning? But you were talking to the choir. They were here, right? <laughs> but, I mean, that's just a little illustration, all right? I'm not trying to, to, to torture you. We've got enough things we can think about that we're, we're, we're in trouble. Already. But I, I want us to come back to the memory of Jesus. And this is, this is about worship. This is about corporate fellowship. This is about honoring God in our life. But again, we're living in this new generation that doesn't want to pay any price, and they don't want to, oh, salvation's free. I'm under grace. I praise God. But then I realize if you really realize you're under grace, you want to give everything. You want to present it all. So let's get back to the place we're living for Christ, not for ourselves. We're living to serve in the kingdom of God, not for ourselves. We're living to reach a world, not ourselves. And so we come back to this place to realize I'm here for the glory of God. And, and I don't need to be worried about it costing too much. I mean, 
Let's think about it. If you realize these gifts these guys brought, these were expensive gifts. Christmas in itself is expensive. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Christmas is, but think about the original Christmas. I mean, think about Joseph and Mary having to travel all the way from, you know, where they were to a little tiny town of Bethlehem to pay. The, that's a long journey with a pregnant woman who's about to have a baby. All right? That was a miserable experience, I'm sure. And not only not to get there, have the baby, pay the taxes, but then they had to go into exile for several years into Egypt. They couldn't go back to the comforts of their own home. That's a little bit of cost. Think about what it cost the people of Bethlehem who lost their tiny infants at the massacre of those innocent children by that ruthless Herod. It cost a lot. Think about the journey the wise men had to make all the way to where Jesus was, with their expensive gifts being laid out. Think about the cost of those early servants of Christ, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, who went out in obedience to, to reach a lost world and suffered death and persecution, the loss of their loved ones, the loss of their own lives. Think about the missionaries, even in more modern times, who paid the high price of their own lives, not only the discomforts of leaving home to reach others for Christ and live in means and, and in, in places where there really isn't a lot of comfort what we're used to, but to face the privation and the suffering just to spread the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the Christian martyrs of all generations, those who laid down their life for Jesus Christ. From the early century church as they're fed to the lions or hung up at, at Nero's parties, they were burned alive to be used as torches. Think about the cost that it took them as they laid down their lives for Christ. Two others let me think about. One, think about the cost for God the Father as he gives up his only begotten son to reach you and to reach me to save all men. And then think about what it cost Jesus to surrender his life to death, a cruel and unmatched death like anything in history. All that a gift could be given for us. But not to take a gift of peace and hope and joy and salvation and deliverance but we would receive that gift with an attitude that we're here to dispense that gift, to share that gift, that we really are ambassadors for Christ, that I really have been buried with Christ and raised with Christ, and he really does live in me, and I am a child in his kingdom, and I have been given gifts myself to use in service to the king. Remember the Lord Jesus' departing words in Jerusalem to the disciples were, go make disciples in Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the world. That's our call. We're not called to come sit in church one day a week and just forget about the rest of the world, dying and going to hell every day. We're called to make a difference. We're called to serve Christ. You know, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8 9, there's this passage, and I'll close with this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, that for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty you might be made rich. We have been made extremely rich. And I'm not even talking about the blessings of living in the United States of America. I mean, that's awesome in itself that God would choose to let us be born here instead of some third world, fourth world, poverty-stricken nation. But he chose you to be born for such a time as this, in this time in history, and so to be used for his glory. It's time that we bring the gold and we bring the frankincense and we bring the myrrh and we make a difference in the world around us. We can honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this Christmas will be a Christmas. You get a real glimpse of the cost of Christmas. At the same time, you get a real glimpse of the worship of Christmas. When you see those shepherds coming out from the fields, where are they? they've been out in the fields with the angels showing the message. And what's happening out there is worship is starting to resound. The heavenly host are singing. The this, this shepherds are praising God. You can be sure that those wise men, as they pursued that sign in the heaven, were filled with a spirit of awe and wonder what they'd behold, what they would witness, who they would see, what they would experience. It was an attitude of worship. When they came in and they presented their gifts, it says they fell on their knees and on their faces, and they worshiped God. Let's get back to worship in our life. Get back to worship on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. 
and realize this precious, unspeakable gift has been placed in our hands, that we have a responsibility to bear and to share. That's what makes Christmas so righteous and so good and so awesome when we start participating in it and living it. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, I thank you today that you've truly gifted each and every one of us in more ways than we could probably begin to even count or measure. But Lord, I know that as you've come and surrendered yourself as a sacrifice, as an offering for us, that we too in, in kind, like the shepherds, like the wise men, we too in kind can worship and exalt your name. I pray in the name of Jesus, Father, you touch our hearts. Each and every one of us today would be ministered to by your Holy Spirit right at the point that we need it the most. And you'd be glorified in this service. With our heads bowed just for a moment longer. Today, if you have never given your heart and your life to Christ, I would encourage you to right there where you're standing to open up your heart and receive God's free gift of grace and salvation. Say, Pastor, how do I do that? The Bible says, for with our heart we believe unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It means it starts right there where you're standing. Welcome Jesus into your life. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Recognize you need him. Recognize he is the King of kings and Lord of lords who came and offered himself for you that you wouldn't have to face hell and death and misery. That death for you would only be a doorway now, not a fear. Ask him to forgive and to wash you today. Simple prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord Jesus, save me from my sin. Lord Jesus, I choose to live for you. Make that commitment today. In a moment, when we begin to sing this song of worship and praise, why don't you come? There's about four men in this altar place. You come to any one of them and say, listen, today I've prayed that prayer. I'm giving my life to Jesus. Make that confession. Remember that verse in Scripture says, we believe with our heart, but we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. Come, let someone in this room today know Jesus is your Lord and Savior now. Let us rejoice with you. Maybe you were spoken to in a moment a while ago. We talked about baptism. And you not yet follow the Lord in that. Maybe you prayed you trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, but you've never made that public testimony through baptism. That's something Jesus left us as a commandment to do, to take our stand in sharing the message of changed lives. Why don't you come today and let one of us know, hey, I need to follow the Lord, the obedient in this issue called baptism. We'll get with you and set up a date in the near future where you can experience this tremendous blessing in your own personal life. Maybe you're looking for a church home today, and you know that you've been coming, but yet you've not yet joined the church. Maybe you're new in the community, and man, you've changed your jobs, you've moved to the location, you bought a house here, you've changed your address, you've sent out all the notices, but yet you haven't found a church home. If God's been touching you about Believer's Fellowship, let's come on and be a part of what God's doing here. Come let one of these men know, I want to be a part of what God's doing here at Believer's Fellowship. Count me in on that. I want to be a part. Maybe you just need to pray with someone or just come pray by yourself between you and the Lord. The altar's open today. What's God saying to you? What's he doing in your heart? He's, he's done everything that needs to be done. He's waiting for you now. You have to take a step. You have to move out yourself. Why don't you obey the Lord today? For worshiping the Lord, you come. Let's trust the Lord together. Come. You step out, come.
Father, how we love you. We thank you again for your unspeakable gift that you've given us. I pray, Lord, especially as we come to this season and this time, as we gather with those we love the most, you'd use us as a vessel of mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. You may be seated. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. After second sermon, it's finally going away, so my wife is saying, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> he gets to be silent the rest of the day. But uh, praise the Lord. I do want to remind you, if you go to the Christmas slide, our Christmas gifts, uh, Gary will talk to you about our Christmas Eve service. I hope you'll be there. It's going to be such a fun and not exciting night because of a candlelight service. But uh, our Christmas mission giving, we have this Sunday, next Sunday, and the first Sunday in January is where we collect that offering through. Right now we're, I think, at 10-4, 10,400, 10, 500 right in there. Uh, we haven't set any goals, but I do know just knowing what the Lord has opened before us and where we're looking at doing for next year with the ministries and the opportunities God's given us, that it's probably going to be about, the offering will come in around 20,000. Amen? That means if you haven't given, you need to give. If you didn't hear what the Lord told you to give, you just gave what you thought you could give, hear the Lord and hear what he has to say to you. Because there's some opportunities that the Lord has given us this year that are a little bit more than what we've added to. One, that we won't be going to Bulgaria. The changes have come there. But we are going into, uh, back to Belize with our pastor's conference. And that's about seven to $8,000 itself just through that one conference. We'll be needing extra funds for our mission trip in June, July. This also covers uh, Tim and Rebecca going to a conference for missionaries in Senegal, Africa. It also covers an opportunity that one I've been praying for for a long time for us to go into Cuba. You know, I, when I look at Cuba, I relate to some of those other communist countries, you know, in, in Eastern Europe that we've been able to visit after the Iron Curtain fell. After the Iron Curtain fell, we were able to see just how hindered and how persecuted the church had been uh, for years in those countries. And most of us knew about it anyway. Just weren't given the opportunities to get in there and where you had to sneak in and do things. It was such a blessing to be a part of those early days after the Iron Curtain fell to go into Eastern Europe and preach the gospel, especially to minister to pastors and to see the difference, you know, that, that is made there. We had a very difficult time this, uh, this last couple of weeks as we took and we 
finalized and closed down the 501c3 uh, Impact International through Dr. Margaret Cole as she retires. It was very difficult. We had a board meeting here in my office and a lot of snot and tears and a lot of remembering of all the differences that that ministry in our church in particular has had in that particular country. I've spoken many times. I've recently had a call from a pastor uh, from Bulgaria. I've getting notes throughout the years of saying, I cannot tell you how much the ministry that you all brought to us pastors in Bulgaria after the Iron Curtain fell changed our lives, changed our course, changed our direction. And I don't think we could have ever done what the Lord wants to do. When we first started going, there were a couple hundred churches in Bulgaria. There's a couple thousand churches in Bulgaria now. You know, and the last conference I did there, we had close to a thousand pastors and their wives who were present from every denomination that's in Bulgaria, every evangelist denomination, Methodist, Baptist, uh, you know, just uh, Charismatics, Pentecostals, uh, Church of God, Assembly of God, you know, uh, just on, across the line, every, every denomination, every evangelical denomination. And uh, one of them wrote back, when I was, the president of the, the uh, Pentecostal Union there says, he said, don't know what you've done without your ministry. He says, I don't think most of our people know it. <clears throat> he said, but uh, we go by the name Pentecostal, but after being taught for those years that you've taught us and preached to us, so we're pretty much all Baptists now, but we just had not let it be known. But <laughs> so we don't care about the title. We don't know that you're Christian. Amen, that you love Jesus. Well, the Lord has shut that door, it seems, for now, though there are other invitations that are starting to kind of bubble and boil around. I was recently called by another pastor who does ministry there, asking for some, some insight and maybe going with them and participating. But uh, this door to Cuba has opened to us, you know, through the Santa Fe, uh, is it San Felipe Baptist Association, uh, to go there. And this, Cuba's been on my heart for a long time. One, because they're under, you know, still under communism to this day. And the church there has been very limited in what it can do. Most of the churches that are there are house churches. I told you that we'll be speaking to the representatives of 250 house churches when I, when I go and I speak to them. Uh, so there's a real opportunity for ministry. I don't know what it is. I just know there's just been this burden in my heart for Cuba. And uh, how much God wants us as a church to participate, I don't know. But we got to get there, first of all. Amen? The Bible says, how shall they hear the gospel if nobody preaches to them? It goes on to say in Romans, and how shall they preach to them if nobody sends them? So our Christmas offering is a time of sending. Yes, if you looked at our general budget with our church missions and ministries, you'll see that if we present it every year in our business meeting, you'll see we do a lot of mission work through the Southern Baptist Convention, through the state of Texas Baptist Association, through local associations. We do a whole lot, everything giving to church plants and all those kind of things. But we as a church, we also take up this particular offering that's not part of that general budget. And it goes to things like Belize and Bulgaria and Cuba, Senegal, Africa, Uganda, where Gary just got back from. It goes to make those things happen. I've often said, you've heard me say before, we're the biggest little church in the world. God, and I say that because God has put us in some very large platforms to reach a lot of different places in the world. But as he's done that, as he calls us, we're responsible, all right, to fulfill that. Kathy and I, we prayed about what to give. We wrote our gift out. The Lord called us as a family to give. I'm going to ask you to be doing the same. It was a gift we felt like the Lord wanted us to give. It wasn't one that we just kind of figured out, oh, I can do this, or let's give 25, or let's do this, give 100. You know, it's something, we, Lord, what do you want us to give? We felt like we'd heard a word from the Lord. I'm asking you to do the same. If you haven't given, you know, maybe you've already given a gift, but if you didn't take time to say, Lord, what do you want me to do towards this Christmas offering? I can't encourage you enough to do that. I believe with all my heart, if we'll just all do that, collectively, as a family and as a body, you know, then I believe that the need will be met. That's the way God's done it around here for a long, long, long time. So let's stay the course. Let's be faithful to Jesus. Let's ask him what we can do to be a part of what he has for us. Because it won't be for a long time. And we can bring back pictures and slides as we do a lot of times. But it's when you walk into heaven. And the Bible tells us in the book of Matthew that everybody's life that we've had an impact on, it says they're going to come to us. And it says they're going to welcome us into the eternal abode. In other words, they want a time of fellowship because you had a part in their life and in, their, in, their, in the changes in their life. So no telling how many lives you've touched just with your giving. Not just by the way you live your life, obviously, where you work, the people you touch, your family, members, community. We touch a 1,000 people and never realize it every day. But you're going to see those lives. But you are going to, so, going to see these people whose lives were impacted, whose lives were touched, whose lives made a difference in. So let's just be faithful. That's all I'm asking you as your pastor. I'm going to be faithful. I'm asking you to follow me in this. Let's be faithful to Jesus.
We're following a Lord who has always been faithful. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness? Amen. Amen. That's two sermons in one day. Be blessed. Amen. <laughs> Brother Gary. Amen. Amen. Crystal's going to come up first. She has an announcement. This announcement is for the youth. Um, we have a lock-in January 4th through 5th. Um, that's coming up soon. So it's all night long. Parents, you get to get rid of your teenagers for a whole night. Um, it's only $10. So we're going to have games, food, uh, laser tag, movies, all kinds of stuff. We'll have prizes. So here's my um, challenge to you. Invite your friends. Um, we'll have prizes for people who bring um, guests. We'll have prizes for um, that your guests will be able to win. Um, so it's going to be a really good time. It's January 4th through 5th, so mark your calendars. We don't have a Sunday night meeting before then, um, so I'll keep reminding you on social media and everything. But mark your calendars, invite your friends. Um, members, if you know teenagers um, between 7th grade and 12th grade, um, this is a great opportunity for them to... Um, Get involved, hear the word. We'll have um, a great worship service. Um, so don't forget, um, sign up. Come see me if you need more information. Thank you. Amen. We do have our Christmas Eve service tomorrow. It is candlelight. Uh, please check your bulletin for that. That starts at 7 o'clock uh, or 6.50 if you want to be on time. Uh, so please be sure to be here. Uh, Food bags, there are food bags. Uh, it, it's your opportunity. If you don't get a chance to pick up food bags to support the food pantry, there are bags available at the table at the back of the church. Also, our food pantry, they have a new connection at the new uh, grocery store. And not only is there breads, there's eggs, there's dairy. Uh, it is for the taking. So uh, please go visit our kitchen and it's back there, and there's plenty back there to take, uh, so please be sure to visit the uh, kitchen. Uh, also, there is no PM activities. There's no Wednesday night service either this week, um, and, you know, I know I, I said let's give a round of applause for our, our band, but those are the, the ones that you do not see uh, unless there's something going wrong is our sound booth, so let's give a round of applause for our sound booth as well. <laughs> Lastly, uh, don't forget your tithes and offerings. We don't pass a play to here at Believers Fellowship. Please be sure to put your tithes and offerings in the offering boxes in the back of the, of the auditorium. With that being said, you are dismissed. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening.